in the first panel, we talked about um, why it is that Jesus is so compelling. And you know, what, we, what we sort of discussed is how people, even outside of the Christian faith, still kind of uh, want Jesus at least on their team somehow. They want, you know, it, it becomes a validator for whatever position they have. Uh, well, now we're going to talk about why it is that Jesus is scandalous. And by extension, why is it that the gospel is scandalous? So, uh, I, ladies and gents, I mean, we there's a lot we could say here, so I'm just going to open it up to you. What are some of the ways that we see the gospel being scandalous to people? Well, I guess I can start. Well, one, one way is the scandal of particularity. That is to say, in Christ alone is the fullness of the gospel. And this gospel is for everyone, but this gospel is found exclusively, wholly as well as exclusively in, in Christ. Now, typically, as modern Americans, we're used to choices. I mean, everything from our favorite cereal to our favorite beverage to our favorite vacation spot, whatever it might be, we, have, we like options. We like all sorts of possibilities of getting whatever we prefer. The gospel is the opposite of that. God makes the decision. God provides it. And what he provides is perfect. What he provides is whole, but what he also provides is something which is very specific, the whole image of the, the narrow way, which is Christ, Christ alone. So I think that's one of the ways in which it's, it's scandalous is this scandal of particularity, a particularity that contains the wholeness of what God desires to give us. Hmm. Yeah. I have something. Oh, I have a You're thing right on. Time. I've got a mic right on me. Still on your I know. Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was talking with a, a younger woman in my mentoring ministry lately. She, we realized that we had dealt with a, a similar situation of, um, that required to forgive someone that uh, was still in our lives and really annoying to forgive. And so she was like, how do you, how do you get over this? Like how, um, she said, I've been praying about it. I've been trying to do all the things. And I was pretty honest with her. I said, well, sometimes I just, I just get really mad at God. I said, I really get mad at him. And I said, I, I have gone out into a field and I've, I've told God I'm so angry that you are asking me to forgive someone or I'm so angry that you are, you're doing this. And she's like, well, how do you get away with that? Like, how do you get away with it? Because that's not how you're supposed to talk to God. Yeah. And I said, God, Unless you're writing a psalm. Unless you're writing a yes. psalm, yeah. yeah. So she's like, how do you justify that? And I said, it's... It's confession for my sin as I'm sinning, as I'm stuck in it. Because I think it's scandalous that we get to be, we, we can share our sins with God and we don't have to pretend. And I think the world is wanting us to be moral and pretend and bring our best foot forward to God and we can bring our worst to him. And that is, a lot of people have a problem with that. Scott? Is my, is my mic on? It is. Okay. Yeah. Good. You hear him? Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Rod Rosenblatt asked me for some help to do a deep dive on the origin of what we call the solas of the Reformation. Things like sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. In other words, it, our salvation comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. Um, and at the end of the day, the, to God alone go goes all the glory. He was doing an article on this and he wanted to know was, were these Lutheran in origin? Um, because as Chad pointed out with particularity during the Reformation, it was the idea of the solas that sort of broke the bank. Uh, it was the idea, not just that you're saved by grace that was so controversial, but it was that you were saved by grace alone. Not just that you were saved by faith or through faith, but that faith alone was enough. Not just that Christ was your salvation, but that Christ alone was your salvation really broke things down. And when I looked into it, I came across a phrase in Philip Melanchthon and a couple others that eventually turned into the solas called the uh, particula exclusiva in Latin. And it just means only. 
It just, it, as they translated it, it meant the exclusive particle or the exclusive thing that we translate as only. So you could say grace only, faith only, Jesus only, um, to God's glory only. And it broke the world, right? Before, at least the Western world, before this, uh, salvation came through the Roman Catholic Church. After this, salvation came by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, and to God alone goes to glory. And it changed everything. And today, it still breaks the world. Um, both in the secular world and in the, the modern church, if you say to somebody, Christ is enough for your salvation, you are inevitably going to get some offense. You'll get, in the church, you get, well, what about my, and you can add works, you can add um, my quiet time, you can add whatever to it. And in the world, you'll get, that's nonsense. You don't get anything for free. There's no free lunch. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you're going to live, you got to work. This is crazy. That concept still breaks the world. And it's, it's what makes, as Paul calls it, it's what makes the gospel utter foolishness to those that are perishing. Yeah, it's, it's not just uh, us being radical or trying to use, you know, sort of extreme language when we call the gospel a scandal. I mean, this is, this is scriptural terminology when it's describing the message of Christ crucified. But I mean, it, we, we've, we've definitely heard allusions to the reasons why that message of grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone would be so scandalous. But I mean, for us, like we're here absolutely reveling in it. It's great joy. I mean, we insist on it. We just won't bend. How could it be so incredibly joyous for us and yet so offensive to someone else? Because it's BS that it's always joyous for us. <laughs> I mean, we don't like this message as much as everybody else dislikes the message when we're in our heyday of glory, when we've done something well, when we've accomplished, or we look at our kids and we're super proud of what they've become, all of which is fine, but we inevitably, because we're sinners, we connect that to our salvation. And the moment we do that, that becomes BS to us too. So you're saying that even, if I'm hearing you right, Scott, you're saying that the gospel is still scandalous even to us Christians? Absolutely. What? No, no kidding. I would say right? especially. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, we, we have talked, you know, we've sort of seen this from all angles over the last number of talks here. Um, what do you say to somebody that says, well, why does it have to be so particular? Why does it have to be so exclusive? Why only Jesus? Why can't it be someone else or Jesus plus? Well, I think it goes back to the central message and the scandalous message of the Old Testament. It's in the Shema, right? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Lord our God is one. And that was scandalous. It was unheard of in the ancient world because, of course, it was a polytheistic world. Everybody believed in a multiplicity of gods and goddesses. That's what set Israel apart was the fact that they were monotheist. And it still set them apart in the, in the first century because most everybody believed in the multiplicity of gods. And these gods were fine with you kind of sleeping around theologically with other gods. You know, it was fine if one god was fine if you worship him and three or four other or a thousand others. So part of it, it goes right back to the fact that there's, there's one God, and so this one God has chosen to reveal himself in a very specific way in the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And so it has these deep Old Testament roots that go back to the singularity of God himself and the way in which he chooses to, to manifest himself. Okay, so we've acknowledged that this is not something that sinners uh, like to hear. We've acknowledged that this is, you know, can be offensive. So then, uh, how, do, how do we go about preaching this? Uh, don't take my entire talk away. <laughs> and I didn't I'm trying, talk, I'm trying yeah. to strip around the issue. <laughs> um, I, the question before, I think, is why just Jesus? Here's a, I'm going to lay some Old Testament on Chad. <clears throat> Ooh, I like it. Yes. Can you imagine God's decision-making process in Genesis 3 when he gives the, the first gospel to Adam and Eve, that he's going to send a Messiah and that Messiah is going to crush the head of the serpent, even though it will bruise the heel of the Messiah. Can you, can you imagine his, his internal decision-making process as he's going through all, before he opens his mouth, 
to Adam and Eve and makes this promise because once he says it, this is how it is, right? Once God speaks, stuff's going to happen. And so once he speaks to them, this is the way it's going to be. Can you imagine the checklist that he goes through in his head of all of the different ways he's trying to think of to save humankind after this great fall? Could I, could I do this? Could I just uh, make somebody else that's, you know, not me, not my only son, who's, who's maybe righteous enough? Could I provide just the perfect sacrificial system and would they live up to it? And he goes through all this mental checklist and he has to throw all of them out the window because none of them will be sufficient. And he lands on the one, the only one that's going to work, and that's that he send his only precious son to die for you and me. And then we go around and he does that. And it's the way to our salvation. And then we go around and say, isn't there another way? Why does it have to be just this one way? We ask sort of the silliest question at all. I always think that, I think he probably examined all the other options. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I just asked the question, um, how, how do we go about then bringing this, this message? If we, I mean, I, I'll, I'll bring it right down to very brass text sort of practical reality. Uh, as we go to the world with this message of the gospel, it doesn't take long to recognize that it becomes offensive to people, that they don't want to hear it or, or they want to add something to it, depending on whatever context you're in. So what we're prone to do is then find ways to make it less offensive. But what's the danger in that? It loses all its power. Then there, there's no... To, to reduce the offenses to reduce the power of what he's doing. Um, it becomes something that it seems attainable for us to, to do on our own. Well, we're, we're always trying to be a press secretary for God to, I mean, we're always trying to spin things around to where we think they're going to be more acceptable, more palatable, more politically correct, more whatever it might be. And so, because there's a lot of stuff that God says and does that I don't like. And if it were up to me, I would change it. I mean, there's a lot of things I wish were true that are not. I got a long list, <laughs> but it, it's not up to me. It's not, you know, by the word of Chad, the world came into being, and by the word of Chad, Israel came out of a captivity, and all, it's by the word of the Lord. And so we submit ourselves to what he himself has spoken, and part of that is embracing the scandal and realizing that, yeah, sometimes what we say is going to be rejected, maybe mildly, maybe violently by people, but God has told us, well, you speak what I've given you to say. You know, don't be my press secretary, be my preacher's. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to pass because I have 30 minutes on this in about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I don't want to take, yeah. I don't want to take it too much of your uh, show here, Scott. I'm a little afraid to ask another question Go about this because you might. I'll just pass. If I need uh, okay. Okay. But uh, mm. so, so I will limit it to like, to one last question. What would you say to somebody who, I mean, man, they, they're, they, they're coming off this weekend they're fired up about this gospel and they want to share it with their friends and their family and they want, but, you know, they've, naturally they've got fear of rejection. They don't want to seem like a weirdo. They don't, you know, I mean, all the stuff that all of us process. Would you, do you have any words of encouragement for folks that are thinking such things? The first thing that comes to my head is love Love those around you really well. And I think when people are loved without rejection, they, they see, they, it's confusing. I think all of us know that we are um, not worthy of love and we're trying to prove to the wor world that we're worthy of love. Um, I think it's incredibly confusing. Um, talk to them about Jesus. He's, he's baffling. He's baffling, and I, I think people take notice of a Jesus who will reach out and love them where they're at. Um, we're not hearing that enough. 
I would add too, just to kind of piggyback off something I said and, and other presenters have said as well, kind of once you get to know a person, you can gauge what particular either big capital R or small R religion with which they associate themselves. And, you know, if you know a person, you probably have this already figured out. If you're getting to know a person, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. You figure out, you know, what's important to them. Uh, what do they think they, they have to have in their life in order to be happy or content or whatever, whatever it might be. And pretty soon, you figure out exactly what religious matrix they have placed themselves in. And you can, you can begin to build a conversation based off, of, based off of that. And ultimately, I think the goal is to show them that religion is ultimately going to fail them, probably terribly. And that's a, uh, that's a starting point. An author I, whose book I read just a few weeks ago talked about how catching people between idols. Mm. So you're, you're maybe, this idol has let you down and you're searching for another idol and that's a great time to kind of grab people and say, well, let me tell you about the true God. Mm. Let, let me tell you about something that doesn't just work, but that's really the, the answer to everything that you haven't even asked yourself yet. Like so, Paul and the Ariopagus. But yeah, like exactly. Yeah, yeah. So those opportunities present themselves with, with, with some frequency when we have conversations with people. So it's a good chance to jump in and talk about Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I, the only thing I'd add, I really like both of those. The only thing I'd add is as much as we're capable of it, which is not very much, um, try to remember that these conversations while they will be beneficial for you and while they might even strengthen your faith, they're not ultimately about you. Yeah. Um, they're about this person, uh, where they are, their questions, their vulnerability, um, their willingness to listen, uh, their willingness to hear the gospel. And uh, for someone who's not a pastor, I guess I'd encourage to approach these conversations pastorally. Um, and kindly and compassionately and graciously so that as you present the gospel, you're presenting them their truly only hope, which is Jesus Christ, and not their truly only hope, which is you. Amen to that. I, I can't help but think about Paul's words in uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, where he says, yeah, you know, uh, some are going to think that the, uh, the, the power of God is weakness, and some are going to think that the wisdom of God is foolishness. Yes, it's going to sound like that. Uh, preach it anyway, because yes. <laughs> Christ, the wisdom and power of God.